I've worked that out. So let's just get live on Facebook in our so join me and Jamal Ahmed. Um, and we're going to put it on the page and on that. And here we go. We're going live. I can come back to you and we can begin. So hello and welcome to day two and our third session um, of the day. Um, and we've got an incredible, high energy, amazing guest with us um, for this session. And his name is Jamal Ahmed. Hi, Jamal. Hi, Brenda. And Jamal, as you can see from behind him, he's an author, he's an entrepreneur. And what sets his world on fire is the GDPR, privacy, all of these things that he believes in. Here's why. I want my daughter to grow up in a world where every woman, every man, and every child enjoys freedom over their personal information anywhere in the world. And that is a quote at the start of your chapter in Voices of Strength. But today you are going to be talking about rising from ruins, a tale of tragedy and triumph. So Jamal, we are ready to hear your words of wisdom and for you to show us your passion and why you're on a mission to make a difference. Over to you, Jamal. Thank you very much, Brenda. Um, thank you for the opportunity to be here and contributing to that book was such an honor and a privilege to be amongst such accomplished other gentlemen. Uh, and so I'm humbled and truly grateful to have a small chapter uh, in the amazing book too. Um, my name is Jamal Ahmed. I am a global data privacy professional. One of the businesses that I have is KZM Privacy Experts. That's where we offer B2B consultancy. And the other business is Privacy Pros Academy. And that's where we help people to become the go-to experts. Over the last couple of years, I've had media interviews. I've had awards. I've had conferences. I've had some of the great things that you would want to happen as an author, as an entrepreneur, as a business owner, and even as a world-class privacy professional and thought leader. However, it wasn't always like that. And today I'm going to describe the journey of where I ended up destroying myself and how I had to rebuild myself to get to where I am today. And hopefully by the time I've shared some of those lessons with you and shared my journey with you, it will also inspire you to believe in yourself and find your reason why and go up and show up in the world and be the best you can be because that's all it comes down to at the end of the day. So uh, if you are watching right now or if you're watching the recording later on, I will be talking uh, about what last week was all about, which was Baby uh, Loss Awareness Week. And I'm going to actually go and delve into the story of my loss. So if there's anyone that is going to be impacted by that, then this is a trigger warning. So please do watch uh, with that in mind. So I'm going to be talking about loss. I'm going to talk about my discovering uh, of healing and also personal growth. Around 2017, my wife and I, um, after being married and trying for a long, long time and struggling with fertility challenges, we got some amazing news. We got news that God has blessed us with a pregnancy. And it was a very exciting time for us because this is the first time after a long time that we found ourselves in that position. And so we was excited. We were thinking about what this means for us. And it brought us closer together. And we really started focusing on the things that matter to us because now our perception of the world has shifted from just being two people uh, married, young, and not really being quite carefree to thinking, hey, we're going to be responsible adults. We're going to be parents. We're going to have to think about what that means for this new baby that's going to come into the world. And around the time of December 2017, uh, during the holiday period, uh, so at this time we was living in Leicester. And my family and my wife's family, they both live in London. And so we thought, you know what, it'd be nice to spend some time with family during the holiday period. However, I was um, still working. Uh, I, I, and so I decided to stay in Leicester while I dropped my wife off to spend some time in London with her family. And the plan was I would join her during the New Year's uh, holiday period. During that time, 
in the middle of the night, I got a very distressing phone call from my mom. And she said, we're taking Rahana to the hospital. And I'm like, hold, hold on a second. What, what, what do you mean? What's, what's wrong? She's like, yeah, the, she, she's, she's not doing great right now. We're going to the hospital. So I said, okay, what's going on? Do I need to come? She said, just hold tight and I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Let's go and see what the diagnosis is. A few hours later, I got a call. Uh, you should make your way to London. This was about three o'clock in the morning, winter, snow everywhere. And I just com felt completely numb in that moment. I had no idea what was going on. It's one thing when you're there and you can see and the doctor's there and you know what's going on, but not really knowing what's going on, being in another place, I, I, I prepared myself for the worst. And that two and a half hour journey I had from Leicester back to London is haunts me even to this day, the thoughts that were going in my head, the prayers I was making, the hope I had, it, 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 my, my brain was everywhere. I, I don't even know how I've managed to focus on the lanes on the motorway. It, it, it was just the worst journey uh, I've, I've had up until that moment in my life. We got to the hospital and the doctor said there is nothing they can do. And we ended up giving a stillbirth. Uh, we gave birth to my, my, my wife, gave birth to my daughter, Aya. She survived for around 20 minutes. And then it was time to say goodbye and go and do the burial rituals and stuff. And so that was the first time I experienced losing a baby. And given all the challenges, all the hope and all the excitement, it allowed me to connect back with my faith and say, this was a blessing from God. And this is also something that doesn't belong to me. God has gifted us with the baby and taken the room away. So we say, Alhamdulillah, all praise to God. And I, I took it in my stride. I was like, okay, how can I move on from this? How can I be there to support my wife? Because she's obviously gone through a traumatic experience. And so we, we did everything we can to support each other and move through that. And of course, priorities change. Work doesn't become the focus. Um, progressing in your career, developing yourself, those things don't become the focus, but we got through that. A few months later, not a few months later, later in 2018, around mid-2018, um, we find out this time, more good news. Rehenna has fallen pregnant again. Oh, praise to God. However, this time, God has blessed us with twins. And this is super exciting. Uh, not just that we've had a pregnancy, but wow, twins. Like, where do you even begin to process that in your mind? And in the back of my mind, your fears come and they don't let you really stay in that moment and appreciate the moment because you're scared. You don't want whatever happened before to happen. And so this period of pregnancy, every single day was very nerve wracking. Every single day was very distressing because we were so careful. And because it's a, pre a, a multiple pregnancy, anyone that's been through this process, you would know that the risks are increased with multiple pregnancies. And given the history, the chances of having a healthy, successful pregnancy for us started decreasing and decreasing. And then we started getting more and more complications to the point where we were spending pretty much every other day traveling to the other side of London to get specialist care from hospitals. And so it was a very traumatic time and it was very difficult. And the energy that, that used to sap through me, the anxiety, the worry, the fear I used to see in my wife's eyes, it, it, you can't focus on anything else. But you got bills to pay, you got clients to serve, you got a team that you may have to manage. And so it was very difficult trying to navigate through that. We got towards, so we lost, um, we, we lost my first child uh, before 20 weeks. And what the NHS guidelines are is up until 24 weeks, anyone can have an abortion because there is no chance of a baby surviving. Uh, any or a fetus surviving if they are delivered before 24 weeks. So that was kind of the milestone that we were hoping for. It's like, if we can get to 24 weeks, then it means that, you know, things are looking good. Things are looking good. And every day on top of that is a positive because the chance, there is chance of survival from that point. We got to 23 weeks and six days and we had to rush to hospital again. We got to the Royal London Hospital and they tell us they have one incubator 
Um, they don't have two incubators. The babies are coming. There's nothing they can do about that. And because it's 23 days and six hours, it hasn't been 24, sorry, 23 weeks. It hasn't been 24 weeks. They won't be able to support the babies. And even if they wanted to, even if we insist they do, they only have one incubator. So there's nothing they can do. And at this point, we was like, we can't in good conscience live with ourselves knowing that we just we delivered the babies and we have to watch them pass away and there's nothing we can do to help them uh, and so i spent the next couple of hours frantic phoning up every single hospital that had a NICU in the uk and eventually we managed to locate a hospital that would be able to support us that would actually have the facilities and they had two incubators available so we rushed to that hospital um i had to come back home so rohena had to travel there by an ambulance by herself which was probably a very distressing journey she was in a lot of pain they ended up taking her there i had to come home get my get some belongings for her get some stuff that we'd bought and go and settle there the labor lasted for about 12 hour ordeal the first baby was delivered. The second baby was delivered a few hours later than that. And one of the things that we do as Muslims is when we, when a baby enters the world, we do the call to prayer, the adhan. And I remember doing the adhan and I couldn't compose myself because this call to prayer that we do signifies the birth. But every single time we go to pray, in the mosque, we have a call to prayer for that prayer. The only call to prayer we don't have is the call to prayer for when somebody passes away, which is a funeral prayer, because that call to prayer was made when your child was born. And so I was making this call to prayer knowing this is the call to prayer for the funeral, and I had no idea when that would be, and I prepared myself for the worst. And this was the most excruciating experience I'd ever had to go through because when these babies were born, they both of them would f fit it into the palm of my hands. Like that's how small they were. There was about half a kilo each. And so the babies are born, and the straight away you can see the nurses, there's about eight different nurses trying to resuscitate them, get them in, and then put them onto those high dependency uh, incubators and they rush them through. And so even just seeing the babies, you had to go through this process of washing three times and putting aprons on and going into the room. Seeing them in the world, watching them, you forget about everything else. Like nothing else in the world matters at this point. It doesn't matter who your clients are. It doesn't matter what your work is. It doesn't matter how big the client is. You are there in that room. And I got to experience a little bit of time as a parent. I, I got the opportunity to feed my boys. But I had to feed them through a tube and a syringe. I didn't get to feed them a bottle. I got an opportunity to change their nappies. But that was done wearing gloves while there was an incubator without actually doing it the way you do it. So those experiences at the time, I knew I don't know how long it's going to go on for. And if anyone has had any children in Niku, all that happens there is the alarms keep going off every couple of seconds. And you're always in a constant state of fear and constant state of panic. And the... They, they rush in from every second. The doctors rush in. There's always one person watching 24 hours. And it's just a scary time. And what they kept telling us is the babies have less than 50% chance of survival. If they can survive past the first 72 hours, then that increases. So those first 72 hours felt like 72 days. Every minute, every hour, something was happening. Something would go wrong. A new alarm go wrong. A new doctor would rush in. And going through that experience was, it, 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 it just tears you apart. But what keeps you going is wanting life, wanting your babies to survive. We lost our youngest, um, Isaac, after eight days. Again, I had to go through the whole funeral burial process. Losing my first child, I... Uh, I could deal with that. It was okay. Hung my head, but I was strong. Second child, having spent eight days with him, going through this process again, that brought me to my knees. 
And then seven days after that, we lost the remaining child, Noah. And at this point, it was like my head was chopped off. I had no idea how to contain myself, what to do with myself. But my role as the eldest in the family, my role as a responsible husband, man, I always take all of the burdens on myself. So I didn't let myself grieve in the obvious way outwardly. And I tried to put on a brave face. But I found I couldn't look anyone in the eye for fear of they might look to see what I'm feeling. And there's no way I could talk about those things or reflect those things. On the other hand, I've got my wife who's been through this process. It's completely different being the mother and the father in this relationship. It's completely different when you're the person carrying the babies and they're growing inside you. It's completely different the connection a mother has to the child than the father does. So I know how bad it is for me and I can only imagine what it's like for her. And we have to help them through the process. And so we found ourselves back at home and we ended up destroying ourselves. We ended up coping the only way we could, which was shutting out the world. We lost track of time. We didn't know when it was day, when it was night, the curtains were closed. There was no energy to do anything. We didn't cook any food. We were reliant on eating out takeaways. And anyone that knows anything about eating out, it's not healthy. So our health was deteriorating. Business, I just let my team do whatever they did. I, I had no idea. I took my eye off the ball. And everything started crumbling. Our health started crumbling, uh, our social friends, people were trying to support us, couldn't get hold of us. We just completely isolated ourselves. And during that time, all I could see and all I could see was everything was dark. There was no joy. Nothing made me happy. Nothing made me fulfilled. Nothing made me want to do anything. And I came across some TV programs and all we did was just binge on Netflix. And the only reason we did that was to get it to escape from our reality into a world where nothing mattered, in someone else's world. And we continued doing that and running into this cycle of destruction where everything that we had built up up until that point crumbled, disappeared, and went away. It was in December of the following year when things suddenly started to change. And it wasn't because of anything we'd done. There was a charity. that I heard about our story and they found one of our friends and they tracked us down and they surprised us in a restaurant. So our friend said, my friend said, look, I'm taking you guys out. We need to go and do something. We haven't seen you guys for a long time. So we all went out for a meal. And next thing I know, we're having a meal and all these cameras and all these people just come and approach us. And I was like, hello, what's going on here? They, they clearly got the wrong table, right? We're not expecting any of this. And they say, look, Jamal, Rehana, we've heard about your stories. We want to help you. And so we are going to take you guys to pilgrimage. And we're going to take you guys all the way to Saudi Arabia. And we're going to take you to Mecca. You guys don't have to do anything. We're going to take care of everything. All of your fl flights, everything's going to pay for. You just need to make yourself available for this time. So that was a surprise. And that's the first time it broke the cycle for us. It broke the cycle for me. It broke the cycle for my wife because we suddenly had something to think about that was positive. We had something to look forward to. And so we started preparing ourselves spiritually for this journey. Going on this journey was the turning point. When we got to Mecca and we laid our high eyes on the Kaaba, Everything shifted. The whole perspective shifted. When you see hundreds and thousands of other people dressed in a plain white cloth, just like you, all of them just going around the Kaaba offering worship, you realize how insignificant you are. It humbles you because all of this time, 
I was just focused on myself and the pain I'm going through and how my life is so bad and how I've lost these three children and how this has happened and how that's happened. And all I was thinking about was myself. I'd never think, thought about anything about outside of myself. And so when you go there and you see, hey, I'm just this one dot amongst all of these hundreds and thousands of dots and everyone's got their own challenges. Everyone's got their own problems. And you speak to other people and you hear other people. And we were part of a group of other people who had all gone through distressing circumstances one of the people i went with lost every single member of the family in the grenfell tower disaster another person lost their whole family in afghanistan had to have their foot amputated so i'm in a group of people who have all gone through very difficult scenarios and sitting there listening to their stories really helped me to get out of my own story and so that journey was the turning point for me. And as I was going through that journey, one of the things that you get to see by the Kaaba is the footprints of um, Prophet Abraham. And it was Abraham that actually built the Kaaba with his son. And he was asked to sacrifice his son. Anyone that's familiar with the Bible or the Quran will be familiar with the story. And I was trying to put myself, because essentially what pilgrimage is, is you following in the footsteps of Abraham and um, his wife, the mother of his child, uh, and, and just remembering the sacrifices that they made to show their devotion to God, uh, essentially. And so going through those footsteps, following their journey, learning more about what this pilgrimage is about, and actually... In our faith, it says that any children that are lost, they go up to heaven and they're in a garden with uh, Abraham uh, and he, he looks after them. So seeing that, I felt comfort. I was like, okay, my children are in a better place. Like, look how terrible this world is. Look at what's happening in the Middle East right now. I haven't been able to think straight for the last couple of days. It doesn't matter which side you resonate with. There is only one side to resonate with, which is the oppressed, but regardless, Life is life. Humans are humans. Everyone deserves to be treated with respect. Everyone deserves freedom. And so when we see that we're all the same, the only difference is the color of our skin. That doesn't mean that we should be killing each other. That doesn't mean that we should be encouraging other people to kill. That doesn't mean that we should be starving people. That doesn't mean that we should be doing anything to hurt anyone else. But coming back from that, when you go through this journey and you follow in these footsteps and you hear all of these stories, it really helped me to get out of my own story and get out of my own head. And one of the things I found is I actually wanted to help these people. And Brenda, we've spoken at length about some of the stuff that I've done before all of these things happen in terms of charitable work. So I'm someone that's always wanted to help other people, but I forgot about who I am and all of the things I wanted to do. And I just found myself wanting to help the people that I was on this journey with wanting to help the people that I'd met with their stories, wanting to share the money I had with the uh, vulnerable people that was meeting there that had traveled from all different parts of the world just to get to Mecca. And starting to help them people started to give me energy, started to make me feel good about myself. And so when I came back from this journey, one of the things that we decided that's gonna help us and that we wanted to do was to start healing by helping other people. Like we should, we should stop focusing on us. Like why are we focusing on us and our grief and our loss? Yes, those things happen. We say all praise to God and we hope to meet them again. And that, that's our test in this world, right? But what can we do to make sure that we are here, we've been blessed with another day, we might be blessed with another week, another year, maybe another decade, maybe even loads of decades. We need to make each day count. And the only way to count is not ask, what can I do for me? But how can I help? What can I do for others? How can we be of service to other people? And so what we decided was we want to help a community and we found a community in Uganda that we particularly resonated with the challenges. And when we got found Uganda, what we found is these people, they didn't have access to clean water. Uh, they didn't have a communal place to come together. They didn't have a place to worship and connect with their faith. And so we decided we're going to build a communal building uh, provide water well, sanitation, everything for this community so they could come together, uh, they could be stronger, they could empower themselves, they could educate themselves. And so we decided we're going to sell, make and sell cupcakes. 
<laughs> anyone that knows me will know where I don't do anything when it comes to cooking uh, or, or, or baking uh, for that matter. But my wife decided, OK, look, we, we can't do much, but this is what we can do. You're good at marketing. You don't focus on the marketing. I'll bake the cakes and <laughs> we'll do this. So that's exactly what we decided to do. And so, all praise to God, we managed to build uh, we, we managed to build a community center and a mosque in Kampala in Uganda. Uh, we managed to put some water wells there. And going through that gave us something to look forward to. It gave us a reason to go and connect with our friends and family again. And they was all buying cupcakes and supporting us. And we went to different mosques selling cupcakes. We got in touch with loads of different events. And the more we connected with, with people and the more we found out how we can help other people, the more we found that I was healing. Or the more that I found that I'll speak for myself, the more I found I was healing. So now it's like, okay, this is definitely helping me heal and this is definitely helping me get better. But I have to run a business. I have to pay my bills. I have to show up in the world. How can I take this lesson of healing and use that in a way where I can benefit more people? And one of the things I've always been passionate about is people's rights. And working with compliance, working in with data protection and gdpr i've always been passionate about the right to privacy because i feel when you impact someone's right to privacy you start impacting on all of the other human rights the right to freedom of speech the right to go where they want to the right to uh say what they want the right to hang out with people that they want the right to worship however they choose to worship and so i wanted to follow that passion in a way that makes sense. So I wanted to bring this all into the central focus. I wanted to honor the memory of my children. It wasn't about forgetting about them. Um, that's not how you heal. It was about embracing them. So the charity, uh, the, 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 the buildings that we did, we actually ended up naming them um, in their legacy. Uh, we also helped a few families in a, the northern or, or the southern part of Pakistan. Uh, we built some uh, houses. Them. So we managed to do some really good things to help people. And that felt great. Uh, so it's like, okay, look, we can help other people, but that's not going to help us with what we need to do. Uh, and so what, what, what is it that I can do? And that's when I decided I'm going to get into the coaching uh, side of the business. Before that, I was just offering consultancy. I know that I can help people. I've been helping my friends. I've been helping people in my family. I've been helping them go from stacking shelves in Tesco to becoming the go-to expert in technology companies and other places for privacy pros. So I thought, okay, that, that's where the privacy pros came in. I wanted to help more people. And I had this vision when I set up Casian that, you know, I'm, I'm going to make a big impact. But I wasn't clear on what the goals are. And going through this experience helped me to get that clarity that I want to help every single person on the planet. And I want to help every woman. I want to help every man and I want to help every child to have control over their personal information so they can be free to live with all of their rights being protected. So they can live a life where all of those rights are able to be exercised if they so choose to. And I realized that I can't do this by myself. I've tried to help as many companies as I can uh, to have an impact with the consultancy. But again, it's just a drop in the ocean. It doesn't matter how big the company I work with is, how many people they have, it's still a drop in the ocean. But what I can do is I can create a community of like-minded people. We can help each other to become world-class world professionals. And if we can get enough of us together, then we can have a massive impact in the world. Together, we can fulfill our vision where every woman, every man, and every child has freedom over the personal information because we'll be working on all of the organizations that handle people's personal information. And that's where the Privacy Pros Academy comes in. And everything I've been doing there has been in memory of my children. Last year, we was blessed to be pregnant again. Well, it wasn't last year, it was a bit before that, right? But last year, we gave birth, uh, or my wife gave birth to a beautiful, healthy uh, daughter, my daughter, Amy. Um, it was a very challenging pregnancy. However, we got through beyond 30 weeks. Uh, I think we got a little bit beyond that. 
and she was born we spent a little bit of time in hospital with her she had some challenges but she's getting better and stronger and more more beautiful every day and so everything i'm doing now is focused on making sure that the world my living daughter grows up in wherever she goes in the world she gets to enjoy those freedoms and it's not just about her being able to enjoy the freedom it's being her being able to enjoy the same freedoms as everyone else because it's not there's nothing special about my daughter's rights over anyone else's rights i want everyone to be treated the way i would like to be treated and i want my daughter to be treated the way i would expect anyone else's daughter to be treated in the world and so a lot of the things we're doing now is driven by the legacy by the honor by the tribute to all of my children who helped me to rebuild myself in a stronger way in a more authentic way in a way where i'm focused on not what can i get but what can i give and how can i better serve and those are the things that drive me and because of the energy because of the momentum because of the genuine sincereness of everything we've done you can see my career over the last couple of years has moved very fast and when you move very fast when you come from a background where your parents are immigrants where you're the first person in your family that's gone to university where you're not middle class where you don't have those connections where you're not caucasian where you're not a middle-aged man and you start moving those fast people can't handle that in the industry so they think you must be doing something wrong you must be doing something dodgy they get envious they get mad they get jealous they try and make things up they try and destroy you because they can't understand in their mind what's happened so the only way they can humanize you is by tearing you apart is by focusing on your move and there used to be a time i used to say that the, 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 there's a certain category a profile of people who were following everything i was doing and just trying to find every opportunity to pick me apart I used to call them haters, but they're not my haters. They're my most loyal fans, right? They're, they're there on every post. They know everything I'm doing. They're writing posts about me two, three times a week. So I have a lot of love for them um, because they keep me focused and motivated to give them more to get mad about. So I want to say thank you to those guys. And if you ever come across a situation in your life where you feel you can't show up, you can't be great because you're scared of how other people are going to be, you're scared that other people are not going to be happy for you, then you're hanging around with the wrong people, right? And you're focusing on the wrong things. What you need to do is not be forced to fit in a box that is too small for you. Don't let people put you in a box that is too small for you. You want to outgrow those boxes and you want to outgrow your comfort zone because you need to show up in the world because you have something unique. You have something superior and you have something different about you that is a gift up onto the world. And you need to go through something to figure out what that is. You might already know what that is. Every single one of us has something unique, a strength within us, a gift within us, something that we do better than everyone else, something that your friends and family only come to you for. Tap into your zone of genius, figure out what that is, and find a way of amplifying that so you can show up in the world and offer to serve and help as many people as possible. And always wake up asking yourself, who can I help today? What you'll find is not only is it fulfilling, not only is it rewarding, not only does it let you live your passions, but it's also very rewarding. The more problems you solve, the more money you're going to make. The bigger the problems you solve, the wealthier you're going to get. And when you create that wealth, you can do amazing things with that. You can give back. You can change whole communities. You can change the lifestyle for the people around you. You can create generational wealth. So get out of your comfort zones. Stop buying into the story of why you're stuck where you are because I did it for far too long. It wasn't a nice place. It didn't help me move. And I'm very harsh with anyone in my family who gets stuck in their story because I've been there and I don't want that for them. With strangers, obviously I can't be as harsh because you know there is no affinity to you and me. So I'm trying to tell you kindly, get out of your story. Your story is going to limit you. Your story is going to hold you back. Find a way of embracing the story and helping it to amplify you to become 
the next best version of yourself. And when you go and become that next best version of yourself, you need to snip those leaves and you need to grow to the next level. And at every single level, there's going to be people that aren't happy for you. There's going to be people that are not um, going to be supporting you. There's going to be people that are trying to drag you down. But if you look at the most successful people in the world, if you look at the celebrities, if you look at the leaders, if you look at the people who are doing amazing things, you will see that they've all had to go through those challenges. And those challenges help us grow. They help us to get better and they help us to become greater. And with every step, you'll come across a new challenge. It'll be a bigger challenge. I remember there used to be a time in my life where I used to struggle with 30 pound overdrafts. I'm at a stage in my life now where I'm struggling with 30,000 pound problems. It's a completely different ball game. It's a completely different type of challenge, right? And so there's always going to be challenges wherever you find yourself. But ask yourself, what kind of challenges would you rather be dealing with? The ones where you're in a place of desperation or the ones where you're from a place of inspiration. And thanks to God, I've managed to get out of my head, get out of my story and start serving for his sake to create a better world, to create a better world for me, to create a better world for my family, to create a better world for my child, to create a better world for the people in my country, to create a world, better world for the people in this continent, to create a better world for every woman, every man and every child on this planet. And I know I can wake up every single day and I can ask myself, how can I help today? And I know I can go to bed every single night knowing I've done something or I'm doing and working towards something that is actually changing this world for a better place. And when you start thinking about how you can serve every single man, woman and child, you start getting all of these global opportunities. You start having global impact. If you'd met me five, 10 years ago and you met this guy who grew up in East London, who grew up on the ocean estate, the most poverty stick and straight, it was so bad that the government had to knock it down and build it back again. There is no way you would expect me to be on global stages with some of the best known people in the industry, sharing the platform with them. The only person of color, the only person who's not a lawyer, often on the stage, in the, not just on stage, but in the whole conference arena. When all my neighbors ended up selling drugs or in prison because of some kind of drug related activity. It's not going to happen. The amount of times people have written me off in my life hasn't stopped me from progressing. The only thing that stops you from progressing is you getting stuck in your story. I could have got stuck in my story. Hey, I grew up in a council estate. Everyone around me was selling drugs or on drugs. No one, none of my friends went to university. I could have bought into those stories, but time and time again, you have to break out of your story and you have to look at how you can better serve, how you can get to your next level. Closing thoughts, I want to emphasize the importance of seeking support during challenging times. I closed myself off. I didn't let myself get the support. There was support offered. What I found though, and what you'll find if you deal with grief is people use the same words over and over again, be strong, be patient. And if you meet someone who's gone through grief, child loss, please don't use those words. They don't mean anything. It feels like it, it's actually more painful to hear those things. Nobody that's going through that wants advice or needs advice. All we need is just for you to sit quietly and just share that moment with us. And that's all we need to know is you're there. You don't need to say anything. You don't need to do anything. And if somebody wants to talk and allow them to share their feelings, allow them to share their thoughts, allow them to share their hopes, aspirations, their fond memories of the time that they did have together. One of the challenges I found was people were scared of saying the wrong thing. People were scared of evoking emotions and upsetting me. And so they didn't know how to behave. So we need to get better at teaching people and coaching people on how better to support people that go through difficult times. But for those of us who are experiencing or will experience or have experienced those times, then seeking support is the most important thing. It, I did not seek that support. If I had seek that support earlier, then maybe things would have changed better, but it had to be an intervention. And it was that charity that came and intervented. And for that, I'm grateful. 
share your stories. Share your stories and seek help if you're struggling. So one of the things I shared with you was I kept everything to myself. I tried to be strong. I tried to be patient, but that ended up destroying me. And when I started publicly speaking about my losses, when I started sharing some of my thoughts and stories, I found it liberating. It freed me. And what I found was it gave me this superhuman strength. A lot of people ask, oh, wow, I don't know how you're dealing with all of this stuff and this hay and these comments. Like, uh, I wouldn't have been able to deal with that. And I say to people, I've buried three children. Until you've buried one child, a second child, and a third child, you will never understand that there is nothing anyone can say or do to me that would out-compete what I've already survived from. And so they can give me whatever they need to give me. It might be annoying, it might be irritating, but I'm superhuman because God has given me the opportunity to be tested with those trials. So encourage others to share their stories and encourage, I encourage you to share your stories because what you'll find is that it is liberating and it gives you another level of strength. And remember, there is always light at the end of the channel. Healing is possible. It doesn't matter how bad, how dark, how isolated you might be feeling at a certain time. We're just stuck in our own minds. We're looking in the wrong direction. We're not seeing everything there is. And I know it doesn't feel like there is any light in the world. There is any goodness in the world. There is anything to look forward to. But I promise you, there is always hope. And if you even just see that flicker or glimmer of a hope, start focusing on that and the more you focus on that the bigger it gets and then suddenly you find that you're no longer focused on your story and in fact you're enveloped in trying to change the world for as many people as possible and you're so engrossed in other people's stories inspiring them empowering them changing their lives for the better that your own story becomes irrelevant and when you do go back and speak to brenda or someone else to try and capture your story you realize you've done some amazing things which then go on to inspire other people to help you change more lives. And that's all I have to say, Brenda. Wow. <clears throat> which I just come beside you. Let me see if I can figure it out. You do it uh, again. Okay, here we go. Oh, no, I have the wrong one. I do it every time. Uh, da, 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 da. Well, I'm just going to give you, I mean, sorry, but it's a standing ovation. <laughs> um, I know if um, I know if we were in an, a, an auditorium, everybody would be on the feet. Uh, there's not a dry eye in the house. Um, I'm still trying to get, get myself beside you. Um, I'd pin. There we go. That's better. And uh, I mean, Jamal, you know I know a lot about you because um, I'm very uh, blessed and humbled by people like you because um, people bear their soul to me and that's my gift, you know, to hear stories and to, and, and it's not the story, it's important as you know, because you've been through it with me. Um, it's the lessons, it's what did you learn and what you're going to use with that learning, Why, what, how are you going to use that learning to take you further? And you're right, um, adversity, is our greatest gift. You know, we're always looking for the happy times and yeah, they're great. But as you know, life is to be like this, not to be like that. And you, you have been through the mill. You've touched the most precious story today. Now, I didn't know that part of your story. I knew of it, but I didn't. It's the first I've heard you give out detail and, and speak so humbling, passionate, with so much love and uh, humanity, and um, you can see I'm getting upset. I'm not upset in a sad way. I'm I'm moved. My human spirit is moved because it's dancing. It's a joy of a, a communion of souls when we speak like that. And um, it really, uh, Jamal. I, you know, I think about you and I tell the world, he is an amazing person, a humanitarian. He's kind, he's generous, he's thoughtful. He's he's everything you want to be, actually. Um, and 
you know, your story of Mecca is it, just beautiful. And, and it made me think of a couple of other people who in their dire straight, um, instead of like what we all do, we do go on inward because we're wounded. But eventually you come out of that place and you go and you serve other people. And you're a man of service. You know, um, I, I'm just going to say a few more things about Jamal. Actually, he should be talking, not me. But I just wax lyrical about this man because, you know, like a son, he's like, a, you know, that book behind you there, the book that he wrote, um, he's had a lot of grief over that because of the level of success he had before it was even published number one in five countries the, the people across the world have been trying to pirate his book <laughs> we've got all sorts of investigations going on you know but you know what i love how you flip that lens it's a testimony to that strength and you're right do you know what i say to people and you said it and you said it more eloquently than me but when people moan and go on about little silly things I'll say, did anybody die? Because you're right, until you buried, bury loved ones, and I'm a mother of four children, I, the thought of having to bury one of my own ch children would be grief beyond measure. I've buried both my parents, but that's the cycle of life that we expect. So yes, it's hard and it takes years for the chasm to um, be refilled with the love and the memory and the joy. Um, so for me, you know, you, you'd be on my stage every single time, Jamal. Every single time. You're an inspiration to the world. You you are the epitome of what you can achieve when you set your mind to it, when you live a life of purpose and you give meaning to that life through serving others. There's loads of stuff we've not talked about, like all the stuff you've done for City. And I've, this man is amazing. We need to get that all in a book. You know, it's, it's just incredible, Jamal. I, I love you so much. And um, I hope all the rest of the speakers don't think I'm favouring you because I love them as well. But I, I'm so moved today that I've, I have to vocalise that. Um, I don't know, Samir's here. Samir, do you want to ask Jamal anything or say something? I don't know if you will. Oh, yeah. Um, no, I, I didn't know that, but I've not, I've not known Jamal. That oh, long. wow. This is, uh, Samia. This is Samia that is actually on one of my programs right now. I had no idea yeah. what's in the room. Yeah. Um, so I, I didn't know this about Jamal, to be with you. Um, so, um, it's, it is deeply moving and going to resonate a lot with what Jamal has said as well. Um, really powerful. I mean, I, I, I I don't really have anything, to add, anything else to add to be honest. Uh, and, and I didn't know, I didn't know this about Jamal. I, I, on his program, I don't know him. We've never met, but we do want to have a have a, have a catch up and have a coffee and stuff. But um, yeah, I mean, I've got a kind of similar story, not not regarding children, but um, regarding uh, you know grief and, and stuff. So uh, and me and Jamal have spoken about it as well. So. Yeah, you know, you're, you're you're an amazing person, Jamal. Uh, we'll continue to be the future. All praise to God for any good you see. You see, so he is a role model. Um, well, I don't, I haven't got any other way I've said what I can say, Jamal. And 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 the the thing that smacks me the most is your humility. And I've said that to you since day one, since I've got to know you. And you do, as a publisher, particularly the way I work with people, because, you know, my team helped put a book together, but I work with the person. I work with the soul. I work with, from the inside out. Um, and certainly, you didn't hold back. And that's a strength. And that's why you're, you're the epitome of a voice of strength. That's why you're a man forging a new path. That's why you're a man who's saying no to the status quo. That's why you... you you're a man who's got the courage to stand up and be heard and to give voice to the voiceless, to create other avenues and paths for people to be that best version of themselves. Because certainly even in the, the, the short few years I've known you, the, the man that's standing there today is confidently speaking. You've always been confident, but you, you are you're just a shining star. I call them scintillating stars. 
and you're definitely one of those and you're here to change the world I have no doubts about that and we change the world one person at a time so um, thank you very much indeed for um, gracing us for giving up your time to come and, and speak and um, there'll be a lot more happening with um, this conversation because you know how passionate I am about story and people using that story for the greater good of the world and also it heals themselves and it, it, it gives that personal power and purpose and meaning to life so Samir I'm looking forward to hearing your story <laughs> yeah and for everyone watching on all of the other platforms whether you're watching live now with the recording I just want to say thank you very much for taking the time to listen to part of my words part of my journey about my children Please keep me in your prayers and your well wishes. And if you do come across me on any other profiles or anywhere else, feel free to get in touch. And if there's anything that I've said that particularly resonates with you uh, from a child loss point of view, then feel free to get in touch. I'm more than happy to have those conversations with you. Amen. Amen. Namaste. Inshallah. All of it. All of it. You know, one word of love. That's all we need to know. So thank you very much again for... Um, joining us um here at the voices of strength summit and um yes and i think i need a bit of a break now a glass of water and we'll be back later on this afternoon with two more amazing speakers who will bowl you over as well with their story we have got sam dosa and we have got um sat winder sagu um again amazing modest human beings who've worked hard to be where they are in our life just now so until next time this is brenda saying be brilliant much love and